Well, welcome back to our office. Today we'll talk about computational fluid dynamics or computational hydrodynamics. There's a star right up here, and that's because this really is a more advanced topic than uh, many of the others in this book. In fact, computational fluid dynamics or just fluid dynamics is a big, hard subject, quite challenging. And you should be taking a class just in this subject for a term at least in order to understand it. So we can hardly do justice or injustice even in the short time we have in this lecture. So I have managed to break up the lecture into two parts. The first part will be basics, and the second part will talk about vorticity fields. And I recommend you take a break at least for the second part, and maybe even before the, uh, that, and break up these lectures into different parts, because we'll get to some real serious equations very important equations, and you may not have seen them before. That being the case, you need to look at this a little bit. So before we get going, you probably should, I don't mean to scare you off, but it may be a good idea for you not to think you'll understand all we cover here, all the equations the first time through. So you may want to go through this again, <clears throat> and you may want to just get a feel for the form of the equations, how they're solved, and then use the supplied code as the basis of a simulation and play with the simulation. See if you change the conditions in the simulation, if the simulation then behaves like a real fluid. So use the simulation as we often do in elementary physics classes, just to give you an example of the real world. See here if the simulation looks like fluids. If it does, then you can suspect the equations are appropriate, because we'll see the equations you don't know if they're right or wrong. You've never seen them before, by and large. So why don't we get going? Look at the first slide, please. Here's our problem. The Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife ha is trying to restore various rivers to have the salmon find a place to live, have their numbers recover. And so they want to put devices in various rivers, boulders, they're handy and cheap, in order to have a good place for salmon to rest. So the question is, how big should the boulder be? Where should it be placed? And if, if they do place them there, will there be a place behind the boulder in order to hold, say, a salmon of length one meter? Okay, nice sized fish. So that's the real problem, okay? So we need to find uh, where to place a boulder. And we'll look at two problems in this uh, lecture. The first problem is over here on the right. And we'll just look. We're not going to put any boulders in. you know. So we'll leave that for you to do as homework. Instead, we'll put either two plates, like a capacitor plate, moderating plate maybe, inside, like a baffle plate, inside the stream in the middle someplace. And then otherwise, we'll put a beam, some structure, you know, a big, long beam, which has nice uniform dimensions. You can then figure out other dimensions, but we'll work with uh, something simple like this both because they're simple, and also there's actually an analytic solution for the two-plate problem. By and large, hydrodynamic equations have no analytic solutions. So this is the exceptional case. So, this is our, so these are our models of the river. There's a surface, there's a bottom. We imagine this being a deep, fast-flowing, and wide river. Why is that important? Well, it's important that it's deep so that whatever we put, say, in the middle here has no effect on the surface it has no effect on the bottom. Okay, that's why it'll wide. So likewise, if this is across the river, we're looking down. We won't. There won't be any effect on the edge of the river either, because the river is so wide, it will recover. Okay. So in either case, we're just trying to see if something in the middle blocks the force of the current right behind, but has no effect on the outside. So it's something small. Okay. Uh, so we have no bottom or surface effects to worry about other than the boundary conditions, and we're looking for a large wake. So this is our problem. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how do we describe the situation. Next slide. Okay, so this slide introduces us to the theory we'll use, and the theory is hydrodynamics or fluid dynamics. Hydro referring to water, but hydrodynamics referring to any fluid. A little inconsistency. Okay. Two assumptions we make. The first assumption is the continuity equation. 
This is a standard equation in physics, probably familiar to many of you from quantum mechanics, okay, where, in fact, much of physics, E and M, quantum mechanics, borrows from fluid dynamics, because the concepts are much the same, but fluid dynamics is where they came from. So it's good that we know it. So equation one here is the continuity equation. D rho dt plus del dot j is zero. Okay? J is the current. For a classical fluid, the current is just rho, the density, times the velocity of the fluid. And notice here that v is in big bold, x is bold. That means these are vectors. J is big bold. Here's an arrow over del, uh, or na nabla if you want, indicating that's also a vector. So that's the continuity equation. Okay. It's the first equation of hydrodynamics. We always have to satisfy that equation. And it just says two things. If, in, in this case, we're dealing with an incompressible fluid, so that rho is a constant. Rho can't change. And to a very good approximation, water, most fluids are incompressible. If you squeeze on them, you can't really get them to change their density. You can change their shape easily enough, but they tend to remain. You have to really squeeze hard before you can see them get compressed. So to a good approximation, we have uh, constant density. And we'll also include friction or viscosity in our problem. The fact that uh, when the water rubs on the wall here, there's some friction. It doesn't just slide past. There's friction holding it in place. I'll, and we'll assume a steady state condition. And the steady state says just that the velocity doesn't change with time. So let's go back. Here's our boulder in the middle. And we're, you know, it's been put, put there. We've waited long enough for the river to assume a steady state flow. And that's what we're trying to describe. Okay? And the continuity equation just tells us that the flow in and out of some area must equal itself or must equal to the divergence of J. If there's something, a little hole there that's sucking water in, that's divergence of J term. If not, there'll be a change in density with time due to the whatever's being pumped in and pumped out. Okay, so that's the first equation. Let's look at the next equation and try to figure out what it is and see if it makes sense. Okay, so that's going to be the Navier-Stokes equation, the second basic equation, and by a by far the more complicated one, uh, the more inclusive one, of hydrodynamics. Well, hydrodynamics is interesting in part because there's two worlds you can live in. You can live here on the ground, sitting on the bank of the river, watching the river go by, or you can be sitting in a boat, flowing with the river, and watching the land go by. And some, and some theories use one frame of reference, others use another. But in both cases, you have to account for the fact that whatever you throw in the river will move with the current. And that changes some of the basic uh, definitions of the mathematical quantities. So we introduce here the hydrodynamic time derivative. So the time derivative, in this case, of the velocity. And it says capital D, capital uh, V, capital T, the hydrodynamic time derivative, is equal to what? It's equal to the usual time derivative on the right-hand side here, the, most, the rightmost term. And then there's this new term here, v, the velocity, dotted into the nabla, the gradient, times v. So this is a vector quantity. And it expresses the, the fact that the velocity is in the current, and the current is moving. And so any change in velocity is going to take place in a changing or an accelerating reference frame. So when you express that relative to us sitting here on the bank, you get these extra terms. And these extra terms are unusual. So when we look at this fluid element moving around, if it moves in a curve, but it's moving in a reference r curving reference frame, we have an acceleration in a, in a uh, moving reference frame. And we have these ver very uh, unusual kind of nonlinearities that come about. Think of it like a Coriolis force. Okay? So this nonlinear force is like a Coriolis force, which tells you that there's these fictitious forces on an object if you view it in a uh, rotating reference frame. So here, watching the fluid on the bank, where the fluid itself is accelerating, tells, gives us these nonlinear inertial type forces. Okay? And so uh, that 
that's the unusual part of fluids. That's what makes them interesting, and that's what makes the nonlinearities make us have to solve nonlinear equations. So it's a new class of wave equations, uh, nonlinear by its very nature. We'll try to solve them. So interesting problem. So now that I told you this is a hydrodynamic equation, we haven't written down any equation. We do that on the next slide at last. But take a look at this next slide. So equation one on slide 24 gives us the Navier-Stokes equation. So in vector form, the Navier-Stokes equation says that the V by dt, the hydrodynamic derivative, which of course is just the V by dt ordinary partial plus this V dot gradient term. So the, the vector form on top, the component form on the bottom, just giving you the x components, because there's not enough room to, y, to write y and z, but they look the same. So we get a, a new term, which is the viscosity, the frictional term. And then we get a 1 over rho, the gradient of the pressure, which itself is a function of pressure, density, temperature, yep, and x position. So that's the Navier-Stokes equation. It's one of the most important equations in physics. And here, if we look at this, uh, what is this? A mouse pad. This mouse pad lists from the San Diego Supercomputer Center the grand challenge equations of science that are solved on the computer. And if you look down here, this last equation on my right, you'll see, aha, that is just the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay? So this is an, an important enough equation to be worth a position on the mouse pad. We should all be so lucky in our lives to sometime be able to have a name written on the mouse pad. But Navier and Stokes got it there, and that's their equation, and that's what we'll be solving. So this is an, a grand challenge equation. It's a grand challenge problem. Obviously, these are not trivial problems to solve, and they're important. So equation one, or equation two, the Navier-Stokes equation. Nu is the viscosity, T is the pressure. How do you understand this equation? Well, the way I like to understand this equation is that what does Newton's second law tells us? Newton's second law tells us that the force on a massive object is equal to its change of momentum with time. And momentum, of course, is just m times v. Okay? So for a fluid, rho times v would be the momentum. Here we've divided through by rho, so there's 1 over rho. But if you multiply all terms here, this is just telling us, oh, this is just the change in the momentum of the fluid due to various forces acting. That's what this equation says. So think of this as Newton's law for fluids. It's exactly what it is. It's a transport equation, because not only does it tell you how the fluid changes, but it tells you how the velocity of the fluid changes, so how the, trans the fluid transports momentum and energy through it. So it's an important equation. We, we, we know here that we have the hydrodynamic velocity. We have v dot del v. That's a nonlinear term. And that's the transportation of the velocity just due to the flow itself of the fluid. It's the unusual term. That's also sometimes called advection. So if you go back, and you should go back because you should have solved first uh, when we spoke about solitons and shocks, you should have seen those lectures before we do that because that's where the advection comes from. And that's where we first talk about fluids. Okay. Delta P here, the gradient of the pressure, is just the change in the fluid velocity due to the fact that the pressure changes, which is obvious. If, the pre if it's pushing harder in one place than another, then uh, the fluid velocity will change. Okay. Viscosity, there's forces due to viscosity. That's the new del squared V term. And then here, we see on the right-hand side of equation 1 the pressure. And it's written out explicitly that the pressure is a function of the density of the fluid, its temperature, and where you happen to be. That functional dependence is known as a thermodynamic equation of state. And if you think of it as a thermodynamic equation of state, that's a way of telling you that, hey, it's not our business. We don't have to know this. Uh, we can't solve for this. We assume this is given to us. So you have to know the properties of the fluid you're trying to describe the flow of. And the, the equation of state is one of the properties 
we'll assume no. Okay. So in our case, the f uh, pressure doesn't change, the density doesn't change, rather. So we'll assume the pressure is only a function of position. Keep things simple, and that has to be known ahead of time. Okay. We'll state. We'll assume steady state. In other words, the, the boulder's been in the river a long enough time, so all the ripples of the waves have gone out. We've reached a steady state solution. So any time derivatives which occur are gone. Okay. So the time derivatives here of the current will be gone on the left-hand side. And of course, this, since this is incompressible, any time derivative of the pressure will have gone. So that's Navier-Stokes equation. That's what we have to solve. Let's look about s solving it now, and let's look about the simple form it has. OK, so. We, we, we discussed the assumptions. We have two equations now labeled very cleverly, one and two. We have to solve simultaneously. The first equation is a continuity equation, which just tells us fluid is flowing in and out of some region of space. That's the continuity equation, because the d rho by dt term is 0 because the density can't change. It's an incompressible fluid. So we just have to require the divergence of the velocity to be 0. That's good. The Navier-Stokes equation, with the assumptions we've made, is uh, given by equation 2. So equation 1's incompressibility, in and out, is equal. And then for the stream width, much, much greater than the z dimension in our problem, we can ignore any change in the z, if you remember what that was from the uh, moving with the current there, uh, the z, z component, the z direction of velocity is 0. So Equations 1 and 2, which are in vector form, become in explicit, simultaneous component form equations 3, 4, and 5. We have the continuity equation, x and y dependent of the x and y velocity components. We have then the uh, Navier-Stokes equation, which comes, becomes two simultaneous coupled equations as well. So we have three coupled equations, and we see the Navier-Stokes equation has the second derivative of x component velocity, this is the divergence type term, the del squared term. Then we have the x component again, y component, but now y and x are mixed together, so it, it's a couple of them intermixed. Then we have the change in pressure with x, change in pressure with y. So we have three simultaneous partial differential equations to solve, and this is for the steady state. So this is a challenging problem. So let's look back at our problem here. Okay. So here's our problem. Here, let's look at our picture. And the x, compo x direction is uh, along the beam here. Y direction is across the stream. Okay. And we have to now look at what the boundary conditions are. So what do we say? There will not be a unique solution to any partial differential equation unless you have an adequate number and not too many boundary conditions. And choosing the boundary conditions for hydrodynamics is at least an art, if not maybe black magic sometimes, because there's so many equations, so many components, and you need some experience in figuring out what they are. Uh, we get that experience in E&M classes for E&M problems. It becomes second nature after a while becomes at least believable. Here, if you've never solved these before, it takes a little more practice. So what can we say? We're saying that we have a constant stream velocity in the positive direction. So the stream is moving here in the x direction all the time constant. So up above and down below, there's no changes. We, we assume we have low velocity and high viscosity. And that means that it's not moving that fast that you know turbulence is set up, and the viscosity is large enough so that the fluid sort of holds itself together. Okay, it sticks to the walls a bit, and we have laminar flow. And laminar flow means layers. It's smooth, no crossing of fluid elements. Everything is in, in either a straight line or a nice smooth streamlines, as it's called. In fact, streamlines are exactly the lines of motion of the fluid 
as they go around here. So streamline for our case here, you know, there might be some, uh, you know, fluid that, well, here, here it's very smooth. We have the block, but, you know, a streamline that looks something like that, nice and smooth, like the shape of a car. In fact, one tries to design cars to have the shape of the streamline so that they flow smoothly through. You can see the streamline in a liquid by putting some dye in the liquid and seeing how the dye moves, or in a wind tunnel by just putting some smoke in a wind tunnel when there's an object, and what you see flowing, the smoke pattern, are the streamlines. Okay. Since we have these thin plates in the middle, we'll have completely laminar flow. There won't even be any particular streamlines other than straight lines, so nothing bends. Upstream, we assume, is unaffected. Okay, the far enough upstream from the plates, it should be as before. Uh, we'll s we have to solve the problem in a finite region. So here, as I've drawn it, we have some rectangular region where we solve the problem. That's our region. And we'll assume that L, the length of the plates, H, the height of the plates, is much smaller than the actual size of the stream, R stream. And so, f therefore, we have to have uniform flow down the stream once we get away. We had it to start with and at the top, which is reasonable. Furthermore, this line in the middle here, this red dashed line, is the symmetry line. Okay. So we really only have to solve half this problem, only from the middle up, because everything from the top and the bottom are the same. We're not including gravity here. So the top of the stream, the bottom of the stream are both the same. They're unaffected. So. What we have then is all our boundary conditions here. So let's see what we're saying. We have symmetry along the plane. We have vy equal to 0. In other words, there's no velocity moving up or down here. And there can't be any v velocity direction along the plane because it wouldn't be a symmetry plane. If it's moving up, that makes up different from down. So along the middle here, we have to have the velocity in the y direction must be 0. And in fact, any, and they can't be any velocity components can't change along the symmetry plane. So we have our boundary conditions here. At the inlet, we're saying that we start off with current flowing just downstream with velocity v0. So that's the x direction here. So currents are flowing in the x direction. And there's no current flowing across the stream. Vy is 0. The outlet. We, it should be the same. Uh, for this problem here, we'll, we'll have even simpler boundary conditions. We'll assume that this is like a garden hose flowing out. The, the boundary conditions far away should have no effect on what we're interested in anyway. So here we'll assume an open-ended outlet, zero pressure, no change in the velocity in the x direction. It just streams right out. What else? Uh, we have here. The plate on the bottom, well, when the current is flowing along the plate here, what's happening? Well, it, there's friction, so, so it can't really move right along the plate. It has to be still in that direction. And it can't come out of the plate, so the velocity is 0 along the plates. The same is true on the top plates. So along the plate itself, the velocity is 0. And those are our boundary conditions. So that's all we need to solve this problem. Of course, now we need an algorithm. So let's look at this next slide before we get on to the algorithm. Well, those th three, three simultaneous partial differential equations for this problem with this geometry and these boundary conditions are simple enough that you could solve it analytically. It's one of the very few problems. See the text. I won't punish you here to try to go through that. But let me at least show you the solution. So here, for this problem, for the plates only, the solution, the only non-trivial part of the solution, is the velocity in the x direction along the stream as a function of height, y. And uh, starting here in the middle of the plate, we have a solution. We have some constants out front. The change in the pressure with x as we move downstream, that has to be given to you or assume. Uh, and we'll just assume that's a constant. So everything in front here is a constant. And what we have here is, oh, 
the pressure changes with y. So as you move from the middle up the plate, you get a pressure increase. This is, of course, just the Bernoulli effect. It's the effect of having a wing which causes the, you know, the current to have to move, can't move through the plate, so the current tends to move around the plate, and flowing on top gives you a higher pressure, which causes the wing to rise up. So that's just the Bernoulli effect here, given analytically and specifically. If you put in some constants, which we use in the code to solve for, some typical values for densities, velocities, uh, viscosities, the solution is a constant dp by dx, lowering pressure. So again, this Bernoulli effect, lower pressure behind as you move downstream. And then, and that's of course good for the fish, and then we have the velocity dependence on y, with you know, velocity decreasing, increasing as you go to larger y values. So that's the analytic solution. Let's look at how we solve this numerically. OK, well, I won't talk very much about the numeric solution. I assume you, re you recall Laplace's equation, which we solve by relaxation. If you, if you don't remember that or you never saw that, go back and read the chapter on Laplace's equation. Look at the lecture if you want. Particularly, we also use a relaxation technique here, and we'll also use successive overlap relaxation technique to speed up convergence. Okay, so how do we solve it? As usual, we assume we have a rectangular grid of x and y values. Okay, you know, so we have our grid here, dot on the grid, x is here, y, all separated by h, okay? And then we have our three simultaneous equations, and we replace all the derivatives by finite differences, and we end up with these equations to solve. Okay, so here we have two equations left, and we need to rewrite them as a algorithm for successive over relaxation. So what we have here is equation three is our algorithm. And what it's saying is, OK, we're solving for the velocity here, the x component of velocity only good at i and j. So here is our grid values. Let's say this is x. Oh, y should go the other way, but it's y is here. And this is our point i, j. And so in order to solve for i and the velocity at point i, j, we need to know the velocity at an x value, i plus 1. So that's going to be here. And then we need to know the x velocity at i minus 1. That's going to be there. If we have a, and then we need to know it at j plus 1, which will be here. And then we need to know it at j minus 1, which is there, plus some half a grid step, ij again, i plus 1, we got that, the pressure as well. And so what we have here is our relaxation algorithm. And it tells us when we have a solution of the equation, or the equations, they must satisfy this form. And so we can solve this by convergence, relaxation. So we can assume a solution in all of space and then sweep through space, use this equation to give us a solution at point ij, update the values for new values, and move on and do the sweep. Okay? And the success of overlaxation says, well, rather than it, you know, we, it, it always says that new is equal to old plus omega times some change, delta. And the change is just what's given to us by this equation. And successive overlaxation says we can modify, accelerate the change we're making, the ch delta, by a factor up to 2. And if we just keep doing that, we actually increase the, ex uh, the convergence. You don't have to. You still will get convergence. That's one of the things for you to explore. So this is our algorithm, equation 3. It's easy to apply. Uh, we now have to see what the solution looks like. So 
this is the end of part one. Go to the laboratory. See if we can, you can solve these equations. See if they agree, the functional dependence anyway, with the analytic solution. And then next time, we'll get on and look at the more complicated problem of the finite beam or boulder in the middle of the stream. So take a break now. Try out these equations. See if the relaxation techniques work. See that how well the convergence is obtained. And we'll get on to the harder problem, more complicated one next time. And we'll use new equations as well. See you soon. Bye-bye. Welcome back. This is part two of our lecture on computational fluid dynamics. And now we'll talk about vorticity fields. We'll talk about where the big boulder or the beam has to go in the beam in the river in order to give a place for salmon. So uh, this is mathematically more interesting. Uh, and it will also end up with a computation which you could use. So here's our problem. We have the Navier-Stokes equation, and we have the continuity equation. So let's remind you of that. We have our two fundamental equations. Equation 1 is the continuity equation. Equation 2 is the Navier-Stokes equation. In vector form, they look very nice here. Uh, but of course, they could be complicated. And re if you remember E and M, and E and M and computational fluid dynamics is, are very similar because the equations have similar form and the techniques to solve them are similar. And if you remember in E and M, we had a scalar potential phi, a vector potential A, often called. And we used those because it was easier to solve for those potentials than it was to solve for the actual fields, which were E and H. Same is true here. We could solve for the velocity, but that's a little trickier than it is to solve for two other functions. One of these functions is called the stream function. And that's what we'll introduce here. Essentially, it's a vector which gives you the direction of the stream flow. And the other will be called the vorticity, which gives you the rotation. So let's see that, talk about that. Okay? How do we simplify our solution by introducing yet more quantities and more words? Okay? Well, if we have irrotational flow, an irrotational flow means flow in which there's no rotation, or at least you know, things may move in curves, but they don't rotate back on themselves. There's no turbulence. If, if we have irrotational flow, we can describe that with just one potential, just the scalar potential. But that's kind of boring. It would have worked for our plate problem, which we just solved before, because that was just nice, smooth, laminar flow. But we want to go to the big time go to the, you know, and handle the turbulence problems handle what might happen in little wakes behind boats. So we need a stream function as well. We need a vector function. So we introduce what's known as the stream function u of x. So it's a vector function u of the vector variable x. And it's defined to be just the curl del cross u the curl of u is defined to be the velocity. Okay? So u is like the potential. And just like the derivative of the potential gives you the field, here the velocity field is determined by the curl of the stream function. Okay? So it's like a, del cross a gave you the b field. Here del cross u gives you the velocity field. All right. So in component form for our problem here, V has an x component and a y component, nothing coming out, so that this m these are the z components, the y components, and the x components of u all enter in. So we need to solve for the three components of u in order to determine the velocity. But notice, however, this is our continuity equation, equation one. If we can be successful in writing down the velocity as just the curl, of this potential, the stream function u, then automatically, since the divergence of the curl of some function is identically 0, those vector identities, which are wonderful if they're written in the back of a book someplace, that will be automatically satisfied. And well, the continuity equation then is satisfied. So by writing the velocity in this form, we can forget about the continuity equation. It's always satisfied.
So you know, if we can't write plus in that form, then too bad. We didn't get a solution. But we can. So let's go ahead and look at what happens. So on this next slide, we see that uh, the stream function has actual solutions. So let's look for a second here. This is from the textbook. You can look at these in more detail. So here is a surface plot of the stream function u as a function of x and y. And you can tell here, aha, this is where our beam is, right in the middle. Very good. And likewise, here is the same plot in the moving in the other direction for the stream flow. The stream is moving that way. Here the stream is moving uh, this way. Okay. This is an open dx plot. And here, here you can see the beam. And what you can see is the, the stream function, this is the function here. And on the plane here, on the xy plane projected down are the contours. And lo and behold, these contours are quite beautiful, particularly if you like color. And they are just the streamline. So if you, when we solve for u, the stream function, their contours are the streamlines. Interesting. And this is what u looks like for our problem. Okay. So if we now go back, equation 1, that's the definition. Velocity is just the curl of u. That's it in components. And now, since there's no z component of velocity, u is just has one component itself, just the z component. And now u we just it will no longer be a vector. So vx is just the derivative of u with respect to y. vy is the derivative of u with respect to x with a minus sign. Okay. So we can now simplify the Navier-Stokes equations in terms of this quantity u, which we'll be able to solve for. So let's go ahead and do that. OK, so how do we do that? Well, we do that by introducing yet another potential. Okay, so in order to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, you can't find the solution of the full velocity field just in terms of the stream function. You need another vector potential. Because the stream function, if you remember those contour streamlines, essentially give us the laminar flow part. We need now to solve for the curve rotating, curling part. Okay. So we introduce this new quantity called the vorticity, w. It's a vector quantity as a function of x. And the w is designed to look much like omega, the angular velocity term. Okay? And the word vortex, if you look it up in a dictionary, means something that's spinning, something that's often a turbulent flow of current. You think of it as a spiral current flowing down. So that's the property of a vortex. So this is now a mathematical measure of how much curl there is in a current in a fluid. In fact, W is exactly just the curl of the velocity. Okay. So this is where, in fact, the term curl used in vector identity comes from. It comes from fluid flow. Because this nabla symbol times del cross V, the curl operation on V, is a measure of how much the current is curling around on itself. So in our case, W would have a Z component given by equation 2. And remember, what was the uh, stream function? The stream function gave us, the, was, gave us the velocity. So the curl of the stream function gave us velocity. Now the curl of the velocity gives us what? Gives us the vorticity. Okay, So we have two curl operations here. They're related to each other. The pieces all come apart. So the curl of the velocity w is equal to the velocity's rotation. We use a right-hand rule. So if it's curling this way, your thumb points in the direction of w. If w is equal to 0, then we have what's called irrotational flow. So we define irrotational flow as laminar flow previously. Mathematically, now we could say what we mean by laminar flow is flow for which w, flow for which the curl of the velocity is equal to 0. It's not, no, the velocity is not curling. So that's what we call uniform flow. The lines of W, not the line, the lines of U, recall, were these streamlines. The lines of W are field lines that move with the fluid, because okay, they're vorticities. And often these vortices move down with the fluid. Okay? So this is now uh, 
we have to put together the pieces. We have to now relate the stream function and the vorticity function and, and then write Navier-Stokes equations in terms of them. There's a lot of mathematics here. It's beautiful mathematics. Uh, it's useful for E and M, but it is more math than we'd like. So take a look now at this next slide. Beautiful, isn't it? And if you look closely, I better look closely too, on this next slide, what we have are two graphs here. Just to show you that these are real functions, the first graph is the velocity, v, but these are in terms of little arrows. So if you look closely here, you can see, aha, here's one arrow in that direction. Here the arrow is pointing up. Here the arrow is pointing over. Here the arrow is pointing down, I believe. No, here's, here's bent over. And so this is a vector kind of plot showing you the direction in which the velocity is moving. And what you can see is that as you get behind here, this is our block here. Okay. As you get behind here, the block causes the current velocity to rotate. You see the arrows are rotating. Okay. So it's not just current flowing over and smooth, but there's actually some rotation in this region where the, the direction of the velocity is changing. So if we look at this next slide, which is just the vorticity, you see that where the vorticity is changing, where you get this curling, is in fact just here, right behind the block. Okay. And what happens here? Well, that's just when the fluid hits the, uh, the wall, the artificial wall. It you know, doesn't matter what happens. It's not physical. It's not important. That should have be actually out at infinity for this problem. But yes, so it, it seems to make sense. W is big just in the region where the current is curling the most. Okay. So now let's do the mathematics. We've defined W the vorticity to be the curl of the velocity. So W is equal to just a curl of velocity, but we've defined the velocity V just to be the curl of U. So together, W, the vorticity, is gradient del dot U minus del squared U. Yeah. Okay. So that's equation two. But now we have a simplified problem here. We only have an XY problem. And for this problem, the stream function u only has one component, a z component. So automatically then, since there's a z component but u has no z dependence, the divergence of u is zero. So we are left with this incredible equation here. All our hard work, we just get Poisson's equation back, or something very similar to Poisson's equation from E and M, the Laplacian del squared of the stream function is equal to minus the vorticity. That's what we have to solve. So your E and M solutions are now very much valid here. The difference is that each different component of W is like a different charge density that we have to solve for. So each component of W is the source for the del squared, for the Laplacian of the U field. So this is the coupling. Each component of W is the source term, the charge-like term for the Laplacian, for the change in U, the stream function. Okay, so that's what we have to solve. So that is the Navier-Stokes equation, the continuity equation, all boiled down to this one very simple equation. We've done the hard part, okay? Now you can relax. So let's go on and relax. Okay. Ooh. We never really wrote down the Navier-Stokes equation, did we? We just wrote down the relation between u and w. We left out all the physics. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I guess we're not done. Okay. Why does the Navier-Stokes equation now, in terms of these new velocity potentials, these vorticities and stream function? Well, we just we have the Navier-Stokes equation here in the square brackets. We just take the curl of it, because the curl of the velocity gave us vorticity. And so we'll get rid of velocity and change it to vorticity. So if we take the curl of the Navier-Stokes equation, equation 1, we're left with, ooh, a very nice equation, equation 2. Yeah, there's all these vector identities, but you can do that. I'm not going to do it here anyway. 
you can do that on your own, and it takes a little bit of work, but then you're left with this very compact, simple equation. And in two dimensions, we only have a z component to worry about of u, so we end up with two coupled equations, equation 3 and 4 here, that we need to solve. So this is now the relation to the Navier-Stokes equation and the relation to the two different potentials. So these are the simultaneous equations equivalent of the continuity equation and the Navier-Stokes equation that we need to solve. And they're both simpler in form, and there's not as many components to solve for. Okay, we just have to solve for u and w, just two functions. Okay, there's no longer components left. So rather than having three components of a velocity field, we have just two quantities here. So we've simplified it quite a bit. They're simultaneous equations. They're nonlinear because, let's see, this term here has a u times a w, a u times a w. So essentially, that's a square. That's the nonlinear aspect right there on the right-hand side of one equation. Uh, the equation 3 looks like a linear equation. And the left-hand side, which is also a Laplacian, uh, also looks linear. But there's that cross term, which makes it nonlinear. These are elliptic type potentials, elliptic type uh, equations. We know how to solve them. So it's very much like solving Poisson's equations. It's like solving the wave equation with friction in it and a variable density, a variable charge density as well. Okay, so not a variable current density. This is charge density. So it's like it's a generalization of E and M and waves, which we've already seen and we're putting together. So we won't dwell on the uh, algorithm too much. It's just a combination of the two. So we look at on this next slide, slide 82. Okay. So again, we just set up a grid in space, x and y components, h uniform spacing x and y, and we have to express the Laplacians that occur. Remember, we had several Laplacians. We had first derivatives. We just use central difference again. And, and it's, it's the nonlinear effects are not that strong here, at least to start with, that we need to improve that algorithm. Clearly, if you want to study this at a research level, you probably need higher order precision, like we did for the shock equation and the, and the, uh, yeah, the shock wave equation. Okay, so just using the standard central difference approximations for derivatives, equations one and two is what results. So we write down the equations, then we write down the equations in terms of an algorithm, so we only have i and j on the left here, i and j, and on the right we have i plus 1, so it's our, it's our same friend here. We have i, j in the middle. We only need these four places, you know, so if this is j, and that's i, we have i and j here, i plus 1, j, i minus 1, j, i, j plus 1, yep, only four. We have h squared here, the step size, this coupling term between the stream function and the vorticity, but it's still i and j. So we have to solve for both u and w simultaneously using these equations. And they both, there's a, a bunch of constants here known as r. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then we have this nonlinear term here, in which, of course, u and j are not only coupled together, but they multiply together as well. So, whoo, okay. It's a more complicated algorithm, even here with the central first derivatives, just central differences. If we kept higher order terms in the Taylor expansion, it gets more complicated. But we'll leave that for you when you do research. This combination of constants r, one over mu here, but in uh, normal units, uh, it's the initial velocity times h divided by the uh, viscosity, so that's what the constant is. This was just in units when we wrote down the equation. This is called the Reynolds number. And it's called, in this case, it's called the Reynolds grid number because h depends on the size of the grid. If h became a constant like the size of a pipe, r, mm, here it would be the actual Reynolds number for fluid traveling through a pipe. So the Reynolds number r is a measure of the nonlinearity of our equation. So if you look at where r comes in, 
His R, it's in these product terms. Okay. So large Reynolds number means that we have a highly nonlinear system. Turns out that a small Reynolds number means that we have smooth laminar type flow, uh, friction damping any fluctuation. So we could get little ripples, but they damp out very quickly. Little curls, but they damp out quickly. Okay. If you get large R, large Reynolds number, and this is Reynolds grid number, say around 2,000, then what the laminar flow we had is turbulent. So large R, which now you can calculate. There's nothing you know unkosher about it. You just do the calculation. It's a nonlinear calculation. You'll get turbulent flow. The you might think, and I challenge you to do it. Of course. If you do it, it's probably the algorithm that's not accurate enough. What's been a research problem for a long time, both experimentally and simulation-wise, is to see this continuous change from laminar flow to turbulent flow. It's been very hard to observe experimentally. It's very hard to observe calculationally. And recent studies seem to indicate if you take laminar flow, you keep increasing R, you look at your solution, even for R values which are normally turbulent, it's like a super cool liquid. It doesn't freeze, it just keeps going. You need to have some other fluctuation, something to kick it, a little nudge, to get it to become turbulent. Whether the equations behave like that is, is are still research-like questions. But nevertheless, here's our algorithm. It's really quite simple to write down. I just wrote it down, okay? And it's not hard to implement because we implement it just by the relaxation technique. So you just start off with an initial guess, just uh, pass through it, all of space, reassign values, and let it converge and see you know when it's converged, if it's converged, you know how many places it's converged to, you have a good handle on your solution. So what's the hard part? The hard part of the boundary conditions. So let's look at this next transparency. The next transparency really tells you to go read the book and go read Kunin's book, which is where we took this problem from, and then even more books beyond that to understand how you apply all the boundary conditions for this problem. So we've done it uh, already. The uh, solution to our problem is not well defined unless we have all the boundary conditions. That's what really specifies our particular problem. Likewise, if you have too many boundary conditions, you overspecify the problem and there may not be any solution. Not only won't there be a unique solution, you may not be able to find a solution. So you have to be careful here not to overspecify it. So as again, we'll, we'll assume that the inlets and the outlets are very far from the central region so that there's no effect. So we have a uniform velocity in the x direction, no velocity in the y direction. And that means that the first derivatives of u the stream function with respect to x and y are either 0 or equal to v0. Aha. So the stream function now is being defined on the input here as 0. The vorticity must be 0 at the inlet. Why? Well, because there's no curl. The stream is just flowing uniformly. Fine. On the outlet, we also have no change in u in the x direction. And likewise, no change in w in the x direction. Fine, okay? because the outlet is smooth flow. If we have, uh, we'll have symmetry here as well. So we're, this is only half the plane. The rest of the beam is down below. And we now have the other regions here. What do we have? We have, just as the fluid stuck, because we have vorticity, it sticks to the surface. Here, that leads us, when you put in the geometry, that the stream function vanishes at the surface of the beam, the top surface. And here, the f there's no flow through the beam, so the stream function is 0. So we get a 0 along the stream function. And along the symmetry plane here, there's no flow in and out across this line that tells us for the x, for the our particular equations, that w and u must vanish along that part. Okay? 
because there's no y component of velocity. So we, they, we get u must be a constant, and constant is 0. So those are the boundary conditions. On the next transparency, which I'll show you here and suggest you uh, study this on your own, this, these are the different conditions which just gave you the boundary conditions I spoke about. Okay, So uh, we won't talk about this too much anymore here, but these are the boundary conditions. What we want to do now is we want you to go solve our problem and see if the simulation looks like fluid flow. Okay, So how do we do that? Okay. So, we give you in, on the disk, in Python, beam.python, there's a Java version. That's the basic solution of the vorticity form of the Navier-Stokes equation. Get that running. Look at it, and what you'll see is that the relaxation technique, the actual algorithm, is rather straightforward to implement. Okay? And it's, we just sweep through space, as we did for Laplace equations. That's quite simple. The boundary conditions, as you can imagine, are less simple. Each there's a number of boundaries that all have to be implemented in some approximate way. That's the harder part. Uh, a separate relaxation, in other words, separate sweeps might be necessary for the stream function and the vorticity. One may converge before the other. You can keep running on the other, but you don't have to. So that's something for you to explore. Look at how U and W converge upstream and downstream. There's symmetry up and below the beam, but not in front and back. So there's two different regions. You should look at both. We want at least three-place precision. Three-place should be good enough for fluids. For di two different values of the acceleration parameter, the SOR parameter. Omega equal to zero means no acceleration. Just do the pure convergence. Omega equal to 0.3 gives you some uh, successive over-relaxation it should still give you good convergence. And then move the beam along in the stream to see if the vorticities behind it travels along with it to see the effect of having the beam in different places. Physically, you know what it should be like. Then do it. And then make the surface plots, okay? three-dimensional plots, some way to help you visualize. We have two potential functions. We have a velocity, so we have three different uh, vectors which we're trying to understand, see if you can understand that, explain what's happening, see if it makes sense, and then finally answer the question this poor salmon has been waiting for for the last hour, is there a resting place for me behind the beam? Okay, so you have to figure answer that. So these are again the beautiful figures we've produced from these codes. This is what the stream function looks like, this is what the velocity looks like. This is what the vorticity looks like. So play with the simulations. Make every effort at this stage to understand physically what these different parameters are showing, these different functions are showing, and change the shape of the beam and see if the current behaves like you'd expect. See you soon. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah, good fishing. <laughs>